We're ready. Let's go. All right, so we're going from the CLA, and uh, we will share back from there, guys, okay? That's fine. I'll uh, pull up Kim, the uh... Oklahoma Cannabis Liberty Alliance. Hello, yeah, folks. I've got it. I've got it. Give us a second, and we will get this rolling. There we it's go. It's here. Got it's it. there now. All right. All right, folks. Just a second, and we'll get this to a few pages. We're not where we expect it to be. As far as where we're broadcasting from tonight, so give us just a second to post this in a couple more places, at least back to our own pages. Ron, have you grabbed it yet? Yep, I've already got it posted. It's out there. All right, me too. All right, hello, folks. It's Uncle Grumpy, and as you can see, we're here with Ron Durbin and Lawrence Pasternak. We have a lawyer, a professor, and an activist. It's the beginning of a bad joke. Or We're always a bad be, joke, though. So. Or would it just be the OMMA regulations? <laughs> Those are the bad jokes. But up, Bing. That works. All right, I'll be here all week. Okay, so, uh, well, while we were in that meeting last week, Ron, you know, they rolled out these new regulations. Right. Uh, I wish we would have seen them before we went in there. It would have. It would have given us a few more things to talk about. I don't know that we would have gotten any other answers other than what we got, but at least we would have known. We got a lot of, we're looking into it, or we'll take that under advisement, we're going to think about that, or we got a lot of that. Yeah. So uh, so now we've seen the new regulations, and uh, you've looked at it from a lawyer standpoint. Lawrence has looked at it from, I think, a common sense standpoint. <laughs> I Wouldn't that be a philosopher sense. thing? Common sense. I don't know. Maybe not. Let's see. Let's see what his conclusions are. Uh, so let me ask you right up front, Ron, what's what's the overall sense that you get from this? Do you think that they're they're working with us or do you think uh, um, it, it's still up in the air? Grumpy, it's it's too early to tell, you know. There's no way, you know, the new director's been in the job for six weeks, uh, the new director of the Department of Health, the new director of OMA has been in the job for, you know, 10 days or something at this point. There's no way in the world that they, they weren't directing the drafting of these. These were directed to be right. drafted under Bates and under uh, Adrian Rollins. So I'm going to say it's still too early to tell. I don't think we can look at these and make a decision about either Cox or Kirkpatrick because... It, they, there's no way in the world that they would have initiated this and started this and had time to really put as much time as they would have liked to in, into looking at these things. So I'm going to say jury's still out. Okay, well, that's good news. I like that. That's good news. So let's get into the details. Uh, Lawrence, you've done uh, a pretty good job of going over them and highlighting some areas uh, you're concerned about. Would you like to perhaps uh, point out what, what you've got first on your list for highlighted? And hey, just to let everybody know, I'm going to try to watch the comments as they come in and uh, and answer things. So uh, do post yeah. questions. I'm going to try to watch them. Um, so if I'm not looking at the screen, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, if you guys have got questions, let us know. And also, uh, please share this, okay? Get this out everywhere so we can get everybody watching this. Um, I think we're going to answer a lot of questions here before this is over. Yep. All right, Lawrence, what do you think? All right, so uh, I had a chance to go over them when we met this weekend, and uh, I read through and just highlighted uh, various issues. Some of them are legacy issues. Some of them have to do with matters that we've seen before that are still problematic. Other there, others are new. And so why don't we just sort of go from beginning to end? And sure. sort of just, I'll, I'll pick out the ones that I'm concerned about. Ron, Chris, you could each, you know, pick out ones that, that maybe I skipped over. But just to begin, definitions. They define a strain as follows. Strain means the classification of marijuana or cannabis plants in either pure sativa, indica, afghanica, ruderalis, or hybrid varieties. Now, there's an ambiguity there because the varieties might simply mean those specific um, types listed, that is sativa, indica, and so on, or they might mean all of the strains that fall within the scope of sativas and indicas and so on. So read in a certain way, it's, it really is not representative of what a strain actually is. 
So I Ron? think you have to you have to look at that and and review the words in terms of their general surroundings. Mm -hmm. And so when they're talking about things like sativa hybrid, ruderalis, Afghani, um, I think or other varieties, I think they're just talking about those what they're calling a strain. As you and I wouldn't call it a strain, but that's what they're calling a strain. So I think that's uh, I don't think that it could apply to like a something like Blue Dream or something like that. Uh, okay, so I, then. That would be a so logical. Then, that would be a an overextension of the of logic there. Okay, so then what I've said in the past would be true that if you grow multiple kinds of um, hybrid in the same room, provided you come up with less than ten pounds, you can get away with just one test. Yeah, what I what I advise, uh, you know, and trying to make sense of all this stuff, and again, they they define things as strains that aren't really strains, but anyway. Um, mm -hmm. What I advise is if you grow something in the same conditions, in the same room, uh, harvest at the same time, which is what a batch is, and you look at the definition of batch, uh, then and it's all hybrid. I What I recommend uh, to my clients is you do the full panel testing that's required for the batch for the entire room and harvest batch. Mm -hmm. Then what, you, what I recommend that they do, because this is medicine and things matter, I recommend that they then <clears throat> on the – things like the specific strains like Blue Dream, Sour Diesel, OG Kush, whatever it is, that they do a terpene and THC profile only on those because the full panel testing covers the contaminants, the metals, all those things, right. and then the uh, THC terpene will get you those for the specific substrains because, again, it's medicine and the cannabinoids matter, so we right. need to isolate what those are for the specific substrains because they're not going to be the same. So that's, my, that's okay. what I tell people. Uh, and okay. That's what I recommend. Let me under let me see if I understand that. What you're saying is they can do one uh, heavy metals and pesticides test uh, in that within that 10 pounds, even though it's different. So we'll call them flavors or whatever. Yeah. Because it's and then the just strain. do. Okay. All right. That's a good way to do it. And then strain as uh, defined by strain as defined by OMA anyway. Right. Right. And then do the the more the full the just the terp test right. on. Uh, all of it right. to get those answers to right. saving a lot of money. Right. Well, yeah, because the turp test is what about fifty bucks, and a full panel is about. If, you know, people argue with me, but about four hundred dollars for a full panel. It could not range up to five hundred from some labs. Depends on the lab. So I've heard three fifty. So let's say three hundred. That is a heavy metal part. Is that what you're saying? Heavy metals and pesticides. Well, I have heard they, that's the more expensive part. They have to run the full panel on the entire harvest batch. So they have to run a terpene and and and, uh, and THC potency on the entire batch, which again, that's why I said those, those THC and terpene is going to be so different based on the flavor, as you said. Uh, right. That I'm run that test to make and run simple. a new flavor test for each flavor that just has the terpene and THC uh, information. Uh, I think flavor would be, you know, it was a word you mentioned while talking to the lawyers. I think it was really about the only way to get them to, to distinguish, to understand that there was a distinguishable difference. Right. So, yeah. I, yeah. So we'll go don't, with that. We'll go with that. I got no problem with the word okay. flavor on that. We'll problem use flavor is, for tonight. Go ahead, Lawrence. The problem is the way they define strain is such that in theory, the grower would not have to do a separate terpene and potency no. test for both Blue Dream and Kush. They wouldn't. No, right. you're absolutely right. That's you're absolutely the right. And right. that that's basically why, why, speaks to just ignorance. Ignorance. Well, it does speak to their ignorance. But, you know, the one thing I would say, and, and I encourage dispensary owners, and because they're ultimately the one that's going to hold growers the most accountable, is, is demand that they have THC pot and, and terpene potency and, and information tests done on the sub flavor um, because that's what patients need to know. That's the information right. that they want. Right. So the OMMA should have really used more appropriate language. And I just wonder whether or not it's just due to their not knowing the nomenclature for cannabis that they wrote it that way. They just didn't have a, they just didn't have anybody with expertise who was playing no. a role in this. No, they don't. They, that was yeah. very clear from our meeting. They they have a lot of education to do. Uh, okay. For and this Morris, is the whole year got? after legalization. So why don't they have actually a, an, an educated consultant? At this point, that's just, that's uh, well, they problem. have the money. They they certainly yeah. have the money to do it. So I don't know. Right. Okay, who, who, Lawrence. Who, who, yeah. What have you got? What have you got next, Lawrence? What uh, what's highlighted? Don Legrand says Don Legrand says he ran three ten pound batches 
full panel, three sixty each. So that's that's what he paid yep. just recently. So. Okay. All right. We're about next right. issue. Next issue is um, a legacy issue, and the language is not the problem, but the implementation of the language is the problem. That uh, for patients, for proof of residency, among what you could use for proof of re residency is a rental agreement. That's mm -hmm. what the regulation says. And okay, that that's you know, and there's there's legitimate reasons for that. So if you are if you don't have a driver's license and so on, but you have, are a renter here, then you could use that as your proof of residency. The problem is, so far as I've been told by a number of businesses, number of businesses that do recommendations, that nobody is ever approved if they only use as their proof of residency a lease. <coughs> Look, they're, they're not even allowing right now, somebody can have a driver's license that could, they could have had the license for four years. That's supposed to be a, to establish proof of residency. And there are situations on business license renewals where they're demanding and requiring additional documentation and not accepting the license as proof of residency for the two year residency requirement. Uh, that's something we brought up in that meeting. Um, they need to, and hopefully they'll educate the people who are looking at these things that they have to go with all of the list of things that establish residency. Yeah. They can't just right. pick and choose which ones they're going to accept and which ones they're not. They have to accept them all. That's the law of the state. Right. And from, okay. From the that, go ahead, Lawrence. For, for the perspective of somebody who's, you know, focusing on, on patient interests, there are scenarios where there are people from other states who are coming here for cannabis treatment and they rent a property. You know, they, I know somebody who, who has recently been diagnosed with leukemia and is moving back and living with his mother. And the only proof of residency that he has is a rental agreement. He set up a rental agreement with his mother and they denied him. They wouldn't accept it. Yeah, and, and the Facebook page is blowing up on this issue. People, are, people have submitted leases, gas bills, deeds on houses and been denied. Um, it's a mess. It's something that they, got, they need to get fixed. I, I know they watch these things. Uh, that's something that they need to get fixed. There's a clear list in the statute 2612 of what proof of residence can be, and they need to start accepting all of them uh, and stop the ridiculousness related to this. Because, again, if somebody's had a driver's license for the state of Oklahoma for three years, you have to be a resident to have the license. Uh, that's good enough proof. You don't need something okay. else. Okay, uh, we've got a question on here that I want to get some clarification. Um, while we were looking at these rules and while we've got an attorney on the show here, and that is about testing the home grow if we take it to have it processed. Um, I, I know I called you about this once before, but let's, let's bring this out for everybody to hear about. I've sent some home grow product to be processed, and the processor is under the impression that he has to test the flower before he can process it, and then also test the final product before I get it. That is not the way I interpret it. When it's talking about transfers of product, it is talking mm -hmm. about transfer of product between between licensed entities, licensed commercial entities. It is not talking about. Uh, okay, so it does not so, mention that. so if I don't get that tested, you'll defend me. Yeah, I, I will defend you. I okay, because that's seven hundred dollars or no, seven hundred yeah, you can and twenty dollars right there to test a, a, my home grow. Um, you know it. It would just make it, it not worth growing. No, look, I understand. You know, but from the processor's perspective, I do understand their concern because you know, if they process and they return it to you and it has something in it, they could be potentially liable. So they, they I would make them. You know, if I was the processor and I was going to process for patients, I would make you sign a, a waiver a couple pages long. That's a good idea. It's not been tested. That I don't, you, you hold me harmless, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh, I would certainly encourage them to have that executed by you, but okay. I don't see anything in the regulations to me that deal with patient product being processed by a processor. It's talking solely about transfers between businesses. Okay, well that's great to know, and and we will do that uh, that release that thing you're talking about because what we're doing here is I've been taking pictures along the way of the whole process from the grow to to when I get it back, so I can show everybody how to grow their home grow and turn it into, you know, the legal amount you're allowed to have and how to go, because, you know, it was it was a little more than I could carry on my person that I needed to send to the processor, so I had to have a processor pick it up, and we're going to explain all this to everybody how we did this for those that grow a little more than what they think they're allowed to have and aren't sure how to, to process it. Real quick, on that issue of processing, 
you know, one of the things in the regulations, and I see this a lot of, with patients, they'll put things on uh, on the internet uh, where they they are essentially processing the, the flour into something else, whether it be butter or whether it be they're heat pressing it or whatever. I just want to point out to people that the regulations do say that patients cannot process their material, and it doesn't it doesn't define processing in a way that would uh, uh, give me any assurance that they're not going to have issues with certain things. Now, I thought just that said you cannot process with the gas and other dangerous stuff. I, we need to go look at that one again because um, right butane or um, right uh, CO two. Right. It, it lists yeah. two or three. It says, right. here's what it says. It says, no licensed patient or caregiver shall operate or otherwise use any extraction equipment or process using or process using, utilizing butane, propane, carbon dioxide, or any potentially hazardous material in or on residential property. But again, mm. notice what it says, any extraction equipment. And a heat press. Using, hazardous, using what they call hazardous material. No, or, pro I mean, that. No, because it's used any What's extraction equipment or process utilizing butane. What I'm saying is that it's how they've written Ambigu this. It's, ambiguity, it's, yeah. It's a huge yeah. ambiguity, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so when I do a, a video next week showing everybody how to make butter, are you going to defend me? Well, that's the, yes, I will defend you because I think this is hugely ambiguous, and I think okay. that what they're yeah. trying right. to say is that you can't use extraction equipment or process utilizing butane, but they did, again, the way they wrote it just is not – I mean, okay. you know. Well, they're, I they're use never, food grade. I, I not use very sensitive to legal language. Yeah. They're, they're, I use, government, they're government lawyers. You know, yeah. you get what you expect. All I use is food grade alcohol, Everclear. Yeah. That's it. No, I know. I, I've seen your I've seen your stuff. That's why I brought it up. Okay. Ron is All right. right. It's ambiguous. All right, Lawrence. What do you got next for us? So uh, next next one is again an issue that we're familiar with, and this is coming out of statute now. I think it was 10:30. A physician shall not be located at the same physical address as of a dispensary. So the yeah, question is, what's a physical address? Well, they but they clarified that language. I don't remember exactly where it's at, but they added some additional language in these regulations that basically say that they can't do anything to facilitate them seeing the doctor there. It's pretty it's pretty clear. Don't have a doc in a box. That's what I call the telemed. You can't uh, do telemed from a dispensary yeah, now. Not the way they've not the way they've rewritten these regulations. I just reread them entirely, like ten minutes before we got on, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's out. So nope. So can't do it. you can't do anything at a dispensary that facilitates a patient seeing a physician. At the dispensary. And wh Whether where is be, that language? What's um, a physical address? Because what about A and B? Well, let's let's wait for what Ron says. Well, it would take me a minute to find to go back and find that, um, but it, it is definitely in there. Um, I don't know if I marked that or not. I don't think I did, but um, right. at the same physical address as the dispensary. Yes, correct. Right. Correct. So then the question, right? So then the question is, what counts as a physical address? What if I had, you know, an office building, two four two seven Macy Street, and then on the seventh floor is the doctor's office, and on the ground? No, that's fine. That's fine. Absolutely fine. Anything out, just outside the licensed premises. So if you're right. in Suite A and you want to have them see doctors in Suite B, and the two physical location and address is different, you have two different leases for the spaces. Go ahead. That's right. not the same physical address. Do you need a physical divider? Do you need a wall or anything like that between Suite A and Suite Yes, A? yes. Yeah. Does it have to be a permanent wall, or could it just be, you know, a mobile divider? Or what um, counts as a? I mean, if your yeah, landlord it, sets it, up it, Suite A and Suite B. I lost my computer there, guys. Sorry about that. Um, it needs to be a separate physical, life, you know, address. So if it's. Uh, if it's just a dividing wall in the same building and it's not two different addresses, let's not try to get too technical there. And you're going to be in violation. Okay. Well, it looks like they've eliminated that. So what if it's a bus outside in the parking lot? Because that's going on a lot. Well, again, it's going to come down to whether that's at the same physical address as the processing facility. If it's a shared common, I could argue, I wouldn't want to argue this, but I could argue that, if it is a say a strip mall and it is just a it is a shared parking lot uh, that is not the licensed premises the parking lot is not the licensed premises therefore mm -hmm. that would not be uh, something i could argue and defend 
but you know it, it's it's going to raise some eyebrows and it's going to potentially cause some problems and honestly it's going to be expensive for me to try to help you fix it um, okay so then if wrong. it's so if it's a uh, a single standalone structure that's a dispensary with its own parking lot the bus cannot be in that parking lot I think they would find that yeah because it's the, it's the same physical address as the dispensary I, I right. yeah I don't think so okay but then it could be down the street it could be down the street could sure parked in be, a parking lot across the street or whatever yep right Heck, right. it could be theoretically it could be parked on the street legally and it'd be okay because it's not on the licensed premises physical address. So, right, yeah. so here's a question. So let's say you want to open up a dispensary in a, a vacant physical address in a strip mall. And so let's say it's, it's unit seven for the strip mall. So you get a lease from the owner of the strip mall, you set up your dispensary in unit seven. And then if you go to your landlord and you say, I'd like unit seven to be subdivided into unit seven A and unit seven B, and the landlord writes a lease for you, for unit 7A and unit 7B, and unit 7A is your dispensary, and unit 7B is then um, where the physician practices. It's two separate physical addresses. Yeah, right? that'd be allowed. Right, that would be allowed. Now, do you? So now, in that case, then, if if the landlord agrees to write you two different leases for unit A and unit B, do you need anything to physically separate those two? So it's unit 7A and unit 7B, but there's it's yes. just. Right. Yes. I mean, yes, you need a wall between them or something. All right, Lawrence, let's move on to the next one. What uh, have you got? So the next one has to do with the transport uh, issue. So there's both a license for the transportation of medical marijuana and then there's a transporter agent license. Correct. And so. So far as I understand it, 788 provided that if you are a commercial license, with that commercial license comes your right to transport. That is so, what 788 said, correct. Right. So um, then it was, I think, in 2612 that they introduced the transporter agent license, right? Yes. And my understanding is the point of that was to allow for a completely separate type of third party business where I could have as my business a delivery, a transport from one commercial entity to another. You're correct. But the, but the way the OMA seems to structure it is that if you are a dispensary owner, then the powers that 788 give you basically with regard to transport are, are nothing because they are reading this aspect of 2612 as basically requiring that once you own a dispensary, you have no right to transport unless then you also get, in addition to that, the transporter agent license. So I hate to say this, but they are reading it as it was written by the legislature. I think they are correct in their interpretation of how the law was written. Um, what it is is that every dispensary processor and grower gets a transport license with it. They did, then created a separate license, the transport license. It's the same license that a grower, processor, and dispensary is initially given. Um, then what they've required for anybody transporting under a transport license is that anybody that's doing the physical transporting needs to have a transport agent license. So that applies to everybody. I think they're reading it the way it was written. Right. So so they, they, they did not craft 2612 well in this regard. And it basically makes the first license useless. No, it the doesn't first. because a grower, a processor, and a dispensary doesn't have to go buy that separate $2,500 license that a transporter has to go buy when uh -huh. they buy the transport license. Right, 788, uh, all that survived in there was the their right to then purchase another license. Mm -hmm. By getting a commercial license, you get the right to then purchase also a separate well, transport agent license. Well, but the transport agent license, I mean, you know, I hate, I mean, in all, in all of this, I mean, there's lots of problems with the transport agent license. For example, they've got um, a two-year residency requirement to get one, so somebody that's moved to the state can't get a transport agent license. Uh, owners of some businesses can't get transport agent licenses. So there's some, uh, there's a lot of absurdities in the way they wrote uh, this in 2612 that have created all kinds of problems. But I, I do have to say that there is rampant abuse of just utilizing the original transport licenses that were issued, with companies getting copies of them and then going in and reporting 
that they're selling a dispensary something under this transport license and under a license they didn't even hold. I actually like the transport agent cards. I think they should be included as part of the twenty five hundred dollars license fee. At least one or two of them. That would but be actually, the problem like, right there. And I that's like, our. I like them. Right. That's the problem right there. Is that they're not. Is that it? They're creating a second license for the person who's buying the commercial license already. And, and right. the way the way we all understood seven eighty eight. You would get the right to transport your own stuff with that. You want to give them a card to do that, fine. But charging them another $100 is just another money grab. It is. And really, when you look at it, it's more than that because you have to go get a passport photo and all these other things, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff. So it's really, you know, it becomes more than that. And you also becomes the headache of having to go in there and do it. But, again, I, I do like the idea of having that agent license because I think it cuts down on a lot of stuff or could potentially has the, has the potential for a lot of stuff being cut out of people using other people's licenses uh, fraudulently. Me, and that was a big issue. Let me ask you this issue uh, concerning um, residency for, for these licenses that you mentioned that um, there's that two year provision. Right. Right. Um, now uh, on page 39 of, of this section, 681.531, proof of residency for commercial licenses. So I imagine that that those commercial licenses include grower, processor, um, dispensary, and also the transport agent, right? Correct. So, right. So the, then there are two options. Option number one is uh, two years immediately preceding the application. And then option number two is five years of continuous residency during the past 25 years. So um, if you haven't been a resident for the last two years, but you say grew up here, yeah, that one's uh, there's a different. I think there's different language in the actual transport agent section under the transport license. I think it just says two years of residency, if I remember correctly. But don't hold me to that one. I don't have that. So uh, why the need to keep people from out of state from having jobs in the state? I, well, look, here's here. the thing. If, if if somebody challenged that 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 two year residency requirement on transport agent license is toast. Okay. It, is, it violates the U.S. Constitution and the Commerce Clause so many different ways. Mm. It prohibits the free movement of people between states and gainful employment. It, 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 there's no way in the world the courts would uphold that that rule at all. Not a chance. So, so why would these lawyers write it? Because it was the legislature that wrote this. The legislature wrote that, and they can they can pass unconstitutional bills all the time. I, I mean, we get them, we beat them back all the time. I, they, they wrote this. They've written the same law for uh, in in tort cases for uh, uh, affidavits to sue a doctor from another doctor so, saying they committed negligence. We that bill has gotten beat three times on constitutional grounds. They they will do that. They pass unconstitutional laws knowingly all the time. So let me let me interject here. So with regards to the transporter agent license residency requirement. I mentioned that section uh, from a few pages later, the proof of residency for commercial licenses in general, but the section that we're talking about here, the transporter agent license, um, in paragraph D, subparagraph three, it's on page 21, a digital photograph is established by, uh, actually, uh, D2. Documents established in the applicant, uh, in the applicant is an Oklahoma resident as established in um, 310-681-531, which is a section that I just mentioned that gives right. the either or, the two years or the five years. Then fine, then they can get through, then they can get through that, um, that way. Where, where this question comes up for me a lot of times is um, you've got dispensaries and, and growers and processors that employ, like especially the ones that are on the border of the state of Oklahoma, especially the southern border ne next to Texas, mm -hmm. and they employ people from across the border to come work in their dispensaries or their grow That's houses right. or whatever. And they're not able to get them anything to for, for their jobs because they're out of right. state residents. Right. Um, I, and, I think it's a ridiculous requirement. What yeah. are we trying to accomplish there? It makes no yeah. sense. That 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 absolutely is, I agree, a problem. A reason why I'm just harping on it is is because I heard through the grapevine that uh, Rachel Bussett said that uh, one of her clients is not able to. Uh, who owns a dispensary, who's eligible to own a dispensary, is not eligible to transport his own products because yeah, of the definition. But, but I don't see how that would be the case, given what I just read. Because he, um, because you might, they might have been a minority owner, like a 25% owner, uh -huh. and they didn't have the five years in the last 25 or the two years of continuous residency. Yeah, the person at issue, I don't want to name the name, but the person at issue 
does meet the second criteria, five years in the last 25 years. So, But they, I, they took that in 1030, I think they struck yeah. that out. Maybe it was 1030 they struck that out. No, no, it was the provisional licenses. So, again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. There's a lot of things that the department should be taking for proof of residency and those kind of things that they're, that they're refusing to do. Right. And, so and it's, that's it's, the thing that we need to fix and correct. That's what, and that's probably, that's what that's what probably another thinking. example yeah. of that. I, yeah, that's what I was thinking. It, it wasn't that they were ineligible. It's rather that they lack the evidence of eligibility. Yeah, but I mean, there's, you know, if, if you're creative enough, you can figure out ways. I mean, I had somebody go get a high school, get their high school transcript. Right. Um, and their middle school transcript to prove five and 25. <laughs> right. Um, so that's there's, there's ways to get exactly. creative and do it. Okay, we're going to move on to the next part here real quick. But before we do that, uh, I see a lot of people watching. Uh, I want to remind everybody you're watching Grumpy Tonight with attorney Ron Durbin and uh, professor Dr. Lawrence Pasternak. Um, we're talking about the OMA, OMMA rules that came out last, uh, well, last Friday, November 1st. Um, so... Please share the video, okay? Let's get this out this everywhere so everybody can see it. Lawrence, what have you got next highlighted? <clears throat> All right, so the next one, uh, page 43, it has to do with um, the obligations on the part of a dispensary for uh, patient record keeping. So what it says is, records containing private patient information shall not be retained by a commercial establishment for more than 60 days without the patient's or caregiver's consent. Private patient information means personally identifiable information such as a patient's name, address, date of birth, social security number, telephone number, email address, photograph, and financial information. So let me explain this. There are a lot of dispensaries, if not most of them, that require you to show your driver's license. And so while you know requiring a second piece of ID itself is not objectionable, if they take a copy of that driver's license and they don't get your consent to retain that for greater than 60 days, they're in violation of this. And a lot yeah. of dispensaries are using this information for marketing purposes. So they ask for your ID, they record all this information, and then they use it to market. And I've not seen any instance where you sign a waiver allowing them to retain this information for greater than 60 days. That's why so I've recommended that what dispensaries should do that are wanting to utilize patient information for marketing, and honestly, you know, it's, it's beneficial to patients to be able to get information if they want it, if they want it, you know, is have them sign up on an email list. Have that, have that at the patient check-in station, yeah. where it's, hey, sign up for our email list. Then you're not retaining patient information, you're retaining email addresses. That is different. Uh, so okay, so let, me, so, so let me get a clarification, a real specific clarification on this one, Ron, okay, okay. while well, we've got you on here. So what I'm understanding is, because as Lawrence has pointed out, and this is a huge problem I've brought up a number of times, dispensaries are copying the driver's license or they're scanning the back of it, collecting all of your information. They're requiring it. They're not letting people in without it. They're saying it's the law. They're then, we all know they're using it for marketing. They're selling it. They're doing whatever they're wanting. Yeah, so, uh, let's, let's, real quick on the selling thing. It, I don't care if they had 10,000 patients the amount of money that they would get to sell that information would be so minuscule it would not be worth their time. Okay, so, I, I don't throw that out. I don't throw that out there lightly, but we'll talk about that one after the show, and I'll be happy to tell you what I know about that. Um, but point being, they're keeping this information for more than 90 days. So what I'm understanding is that they should not be able to do this. They're breaking the law in all those files where they have copies of everybody's driver's license from every sale uh, th that they've every customer they've seen since they've used these their new system, their C to sell tracking system, which tells them that they need that and they haven't figured out how to bypass it. So the, the in, in talking with dispensaries uh, about this specific issue, uh, because it is something you and I've talked about before, some of them indicate and have shown me that their point of sale system uh, won't input the patient without them doing that. Others utilize it because then they can scan the ID and it auto-populates the patient ID information and stuff so they can verify the license again in a more efficient manner. What, I, again, I, I would recommend to dispensaries is, first of all, it's not required by the law to have the driver's license. That's clear, it is not required. You do not have to present a driver's license. But if your system requires it, 
or you want to utilize it to speed up the process, et cetera, et cetera, then let the customer or the patient know and get their consent. It's really that it's really that simple. And if they don't want to give it to you and they don't want to be they don't want to streamline the process, then just take their patient card and let them come in. If your point of sale system won't allow you to to sell to them because you don't have their driver's license, then get a different point of sale system. Okay, yeah, I think the uh, rewards programs are great. And if someone's if they're be, if they're being told, hey, we'd like to keep your information for a rewards program, that's great. I, I'm all for that. It's the ones. What bothers me, just to end this part, is the ones that demand it and they say it's the law. All right, Lawrence, what have you got next? Page 45, Composition of Food Safety Standards Board. Um, the one thing I just want to bring up is that it formerly was the case that that board had a patient representative. It no longer does. Yep, um, it does not. It now has, but it does have an industry representative. Um, and let me get to that, page 45. Um, you sure page 45? Uh, on my printout, yeah, page 45, section. Yeah, section you uh, you printed out an earlier version, I think, because oh. they, they, they changed it. They re-uploaded re it today with some more stuff in it. Oh, uh, I didn't see today. Really? Yeah. Well, they'd left out, like, Chapter 6. They'd left it out on accident, uh, so they re they republished it from that. Um, and it, does it still take paper. effect? Oh, wait, Ron, does it still take effect on the 15th? Well, no, that's the problem. So I, I went back through, because you and I were talking about that the other day, and I, so I went back through and checked, and then I checked the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, it, this became effective and went into effect and is enforceable as of November 1st. There's yeah, no, there was no delay. The, uh, right. There was no this delay the, at all. Yeah. It's a related effective. issue. Go on. No, go ahead, Lawrence. Why are why is this you know an emergency, right? Why is are these things being issued under an emergency? Didn't they have enough time? It's been an entire year. Well, so the most of the changes were based on the laws that went into effect on November the first. Right, and but they, they couldn't pass also, rules right. related to those laws until those laws were in effect. Right. But, Should they have had a public comment period, even if it was a short one? Absolutely. Could yeah. they have facilitated that? Absolutely. But again, yeah. I'm going to go back to this is a former administration issue in the Department of Health and at the OMMA, and not a current issue. So I'm not going to hold their feet to the fire for for this right now. Yes, it's screwed up, but honestly, I I'm I blame Bates and Rollins. Yep. Uh, for the March, way they've done all right. of these things. Yeah. March, April, give or take, is when most of these laws were voted upon. They had, you know, at least that amount of, you know, lead time, seven months, give I, or take. Correct. Yeah. I, I completely agree. They could have easily had a public comment period. Yep. They didn't do it. And again, right. you know, it's, it goes back to Bates and Rollins. I'm going to give yep. Gary Cox and, and Kirkpatrick yep. a pass on this set, on this set yep. only, but this set I'm going to give them a pass. And, and, well, and me, but... Isn't it the same attorneys, though? I it mean, is, aren't we that, still looking? The it's the same attorneys. And, 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 and aren't they the ones who said at the beginning of that meeting that they were the ones responsible for the regulations? Because what it They're, felt like to me, it, yes. it felt like to me like uh, uh, Cox, and the head of the health department, and Kirkpatrick, the head of the OMA, both seemed like very open guys, nice guys who really want to just make things work as smoothly as possible. Um, but they're deferring to their attorneys for everything, and the attorneys seem to be okay with conflict in their own regulations. They are okay with conflict in their own regulations, which makes no uh, sense. You have, to read, you have to read a law in harmony with other parts of the law to make it make make it make sense uh, with right. other parts. And then they're not doing that. That's one of the things Rachel pointed out uh, to them, and they just kind of had this blank stare. Um, because again, I, 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 I'm going to go back and say this again. I'm sure there's a lot of wonderful government attorneys that work for the state of Oklahoma. Um, but, you know, there's an old saying is from lawyers, those who can do and those who can't go work for the government. All right, Lawrence, what have you got next? Let me just, let me just sort of say a related issue uh, to this, that I, I certainly had the feeling that there was an adversarial attitude on the part of, of you know, the, they'll call it the Rollins administration of the OMMA yes. and the people of this state. And so why is it that this regulatory agency has an adversarial relationship to, you know, the population that they're there to serve? Why, adver why is it adversarial? 
you know, other than just this historical legacy, because hippies smoked marijuana and we're the government and hippies didn't like the government. So we don't like people who smoke marijuana. It's like this is completely yeah. antiquated. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's 60 years of history gone. Why are they still sticking with it? Uh, reefer madness. I mean, it, it's alive and well in, in cities and counties across the state and certainly in the state. And again, we, we have. I mean, look look at the logic of this. We have Tom Bates who shut down the call center, shut down access to and people responding to emails, stop people from being able to go to the OMA, to the Department of Health and get questions answered or talk to somebody who and who put Rollins in the job who wasn't even qualified to be there in the first place, who'd already been found in a previous investigation to have not have the qualification for the job she had, so they promoted her to this director position. Um, and then, you know, he leaves and is appointed by Stitt as the person in charge of government access by the people to help <laughs> figure out ways for the people to get more access to the government. Yeah, I mean, I this, is the logic, this is the logic we're talking about here. Um, it, it's you're never going to make sense of it, Lawrence. Uh, yeah. I, I, trust me, I, I, I've, I've tried yeah. all the time and I never can come up with it. Cannabis well. had been used for thousands of years, unobjectionably, unproblematically, you know, uh, physicians in the United States prescribed it in the 19th century and early 20th century. And it's it's only this weird, bizarre quirk of history that it's not legal now. And, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, this I is a bigger saying, issue. Marijuana, but... marijuana is certainly not those things, but physicians used to prescribe cocaine and, and opium and laudanum and all those things too. So I, I don't like that argument, but here's the thing. We, we've, the people have voted that this is medicine in the state of Oklahoma. Get over yourselves. It is yeah. medicine in the but, state of Oklahoma as far but, as the people are concerned. Right. The, the history though of, of cannabis prescribing is, is a different history. No, I agree. Because, I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. Lawrence, if, if we're going to get, if we're going to get to any of these, we're going to have to move on. Okay. Right, go ahead, Grumpy. Keep us, keep us on track, Grumpy. Keep I'm us trying. On track. It's a little bit, right. a little tough sometimes. Right. What's next on your list, Lawrence? So delivery. Well, by the way, Casey Stark, real quick, asked: Does Oklahoma have any license testing labs? Not under the current regulations. There are no license testing labs. I know we're going to talk about license testing in a minute. And by the yeah. way, I, you know, we can go as long as you guys want. I'm, I love talking about this stuff. Okay, Lawrence, you brought up uh, delivery. Let's talk right. about that. So there, there is no, there is no statute that prohibits delivery. Correct. Delivery. The prohibition of delivery is solely in virtue of this regulation. And as I read, as I read uh, the Attorney General's letter from um, last July, where the Attorney General overrode the Board of Health's ban on flour and basically set out some language with regards to what powers the Department of Health has and doesn't have concerning um, interference with business practices, it strikes me that the that the, the Department of Health, the OBMA, doesn't have the power to say you can't deliver. And nobody's why is why has nobody challenged this? Think about all the benefits. There are patients who who you know are having an MS flare and have to get behind the wheel to go get their cannabis. There are people with physical ailments that are being forced to drive to a location because of this, not because of a statute, just because I, of some regulator. You, from my perspective, I can tell you why I have not challenged that one is mm -hmm. because you know in all of the insanity of these rules it's, a, it's i had to prioritize time because you know i do these things for free when i challenge a law i'm mm -hmm. doing it for free and so i have to prioritize like time and, and effort and the reason why i haven't challenged it, and i think you're absolutely correct that it is something that could be clearly challenged as being far be, is beyond the scope of the authority granted to the agency um the reason why i have not challenged it is because we do have the ability to get a patient caregiver license for free. And so that's why I've not challenged it is because there is a way for those people to get access for medicine if they can't drive. If there wasn't that, I'd challenge it. Uh, yeah. And I think it would be, I think it's, I think it's one that honestly, like a dispensary that wanted to get into that business should look at putting up some money and, and fighting it. Um, right. But uh, I, and that's so my there position. is that option, but there's just lots of people who they're normally able to, right? But then now's the day that their lupus is acting up, their MS is acting up, whatever it is, that normally they're able to go. But, you know, here's a day where it's just agony for them to have to deal with it. And so, so get you the know, caregiver fourth, license. Right, I, I mean, right, that's, it's right. free. It's free right. to get the caregiver license. And so they go, damn, I should have gotten a caregiver license. But that very day is still a day where they're suffering. 
No, I know, but that's why I always argue, like, as soon as you get your, if you if you think that this is, if your condition is one that would dictate or could have days like that, like, there's days where I get migraines, and there's no way in yeah. the world I could go anywhere. Yeah. Um, get your patient license, and then immediately apply for somebody to be a caregiver to be there for you when you need it. Yeah. But okay. if, if, a a, if a dispensary wants to challenge it, they can call me. On a similar note, let me ask Ron, what about a drive through window? It's legal. Okay, just check. I don't think it's, I don't think it's advisable at right. all. Well, but isn't it supposed to be? Isn't the transaction supposed to be done out of sight or something? Can that be nope, still considered out of sight? That's not required either. Okay, all right, all right, yeah, Lawrence, what do you got next? Where are we? Yeah, on the on the on the on the um, window issue. Here's the mm -hmm. problem I have. You you have a patient come up to the window. There's three other people in the car. That, you know, you're doing a transaction with them, and they're talking about. They're asking their friend, their other people in the car, what they want to buy. To me, right. then you are knowingly helping facilitate the illegal distribution of marijuana. That is a so felony. If, that is why I hate that. I hate the dispensary window idea. So if you're going to do it, you better be very picky about how and when you do it. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's good to know. All right, Lawrence, what you got? All right, so you know. Stop me if I'm skipping over, Ron. Stop me if I'm skipping over something that, that you want to address. But I'm now moving into sample collection. Okay. And so, you know, who are these samplers? Who are they hired by? The lab. Um, the, lab. the lab. Yes. And all samples must be delivered the day of collection. Correct. So I understand that at least, you know, some owners find that this, this to be very problematic in terms of their production and their harvest and their batches and so on that you know the the timeline maybe chris you could explain this better but they've had there have been people who have been complaining that the way in which this language is written doesn't work with their business structure yeah they send stuff to the uh to the labs um, almost every single day and to then slow it down to a weekly pickup or whatever the lab can then do depending on where you're located could really slow everything down um, they're a processor and grower, so we're not just talking about harvests, which happen on a regular basis, but we're also this, we're also talking about every time they make up a 10-pound batch of brownies, just as an example. No, because if, if they if they had the distillate tested, they don't have to test the brownies. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, so still, the, even from the grower's perspective, with the multiple harvests, from the grower's perspective. This is, seems like a real problem. And I want to ask, because I've had this argument with a lot of people, or a couple key people that seem to think the price of the testing is not going to go up. How? Yeah, uh, yeah how could it not? Yeah, explain what you think is going to happen in the cost of, of testing, Ron, and now, why. Well, the cost of the testing might not go up. The cost of the sample collection, there's going to be an additional charge for sample collection. So the test technically won't change price, but the overall amount you have to spend for the sample collection is gonna be exponentially higher. The problem we've got is when you look at the number of licensed uh, processors and growers we have, that is a lot of businesses that these laboratories are gonna to have to service. When we start talking about laboratories, we're gonna talk about how hard it's gonna be for these people to get, get their licenses. It is gonna be extremely expensive. And, and not on, on top of that, one of the things that uh, you know, really has not been talked about from anything that I've seen is that most of these growers and processors don't want somebody coming in their facility that's been in 10 other grows that day. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of potential for things to ride on clothing to get right. into your clean facility and, and then contaminate your products. It's the sample collection, and I, and I talked to somebody from Fast Lab. I did a video about this the other day when I was reading through these, and somebody from Fast Labs, I can't remember his name, uh, he made some comments about you know, that they were aware of this and they were looking into it and that they they have some solutions, but yes, there would be a charge for the sample collection. Um, the problem, as it comes down to it, and when I talked to him about it, I was like, they could train people and every once in a while have to go there and make sure that they're collecting samples in the manner that they want them to. So they could, there could be spot checks where the laboratory so often has to go get its own sample. If you want to like have some kind of thing where a grower is not using the same batch to just constantly get it tested, changing the batch number, and they're using the same flour that they know is clean and has was you know high THC you mean, content. You mean the labs could come train someone at the grow? Is that what you they, mean? They could train somebody at the grow, but additionally, okay. labs as part of their deal could require that, 
every 10th test or every 20th test, they come collect the samples to make sure that they're testing new flower, new distillate, whatever, and that the grower is not just right. holding back a good batch and resending right. it to get a new test for a new batch. So there's ways to solve the problem without requiring them to be there every single solitary time. So do you have do you have any sort of a even a ballpark as to what this sample collection is going to cost? Well, you think about it this way: they've got what from the business perspective of the laboratory, you've got wages for the employee to go collect the laboratory stuff. You've got or to get, collect the samples. You've got insurance on a vehicle because they're going to be an employee that's operating a vehicle while at work. So you've got commercial insurance issues. You've got huge potential liability issues. You've got workers' comp potential problems with them being offsite of your laboratory. Uh, I, I think to pass the cost along, it could be fairly substantial. Uh, and then you've got also operation of the automobile expenses between the locations. Okay, so so. So I'm a little I'm a little lab or I'm a, I'm a little grow in southeast Oklahoma, and I've got a 10 pound harvest coming up tomorrow, and I need a lab to come down because I need to flip this fairly soon, and so I call a lab and they come down, and now I'm paying the 360 for the full panel testing, and what another 200 dollars, another 300 dollars, another 400 dollars? I mean, I don't think they're going to be able to come collect. They're not going to come collect. It's not financially worth it for them to come collect for less than 200 bucks. Let me raise an issue here. <clears throat> there was no mechanism for county opt-out that um, there was an attempt through the Senate to have a bill for county opt-out right. that failed. This is how they get their county opt-out. That basically yep. to make it financially unfeasible for there to be cannabis businesses at least growers and processors outside of uh, major urban areas. Yeah, well, it'll no, certainly it, have that effect. Well, wait, so real quick, since we're talking about transporting, look at the, and I know where I'm jumping ahead, but look at the waste management bill. The waste management bill says that when they come pick up waste, they have to have a log showing how they're going to get the back to the, uh, back to the waste management uh, facility by direct route. So they can't stop by 15 places. They had to pick up your medical marijuana waste and drive by direct route back. To wow. The yeah, well, that just I, got I'm more skipping, expensive. I'm skipping ahead. That's waste management. But, uh, yeah, by direct route. That just got considerably more expensive. They got considerably more trash mafia-ish. Yep. The Soprano, Soprano bill. bill. We've been saying, yeah. Yeah. The Soprano bill. All right, Lawrence, what have you got next? Let's move through these a little the next, quicker the if next, we can. The next one is a doozy. Um, that uh, the size of the samples, it has to be 0.5% of the total harvest batch or production batch and another 0.5% of, um, of those things as a reserve sample. So are you yeah, telling on me? A 10 pound, uh, on a 10-pound batch, on a 10-pound batch, that's 2.26 grams. It's not as bad. It sounds bad, but it's not as bad. Is point is point five percent. So if you take four hundred and fifty something grams per pound, it's four fifty four, and it's ten, and it's ten, it's one full percent when you add them both up. The no, OMA, it's not. It's, no, it's point five and point five. That's one percent. You have to send one. You have to send a point five, and point five has to be pulled back to be tested down the road if it needs to be. Because they don't realize the cannabis changes over time. Right. It's 45 the reason why I went to law school and I did not become a mathematician is because. So, so that's 45 grams a pound. That's. Uh, 10 pounds, that's 450 grams. If you've got a 100 pound batch. Right. It's 45 grams per 10 pound. 454 grams a pound, right? Yes. All right. So for 10 pounds, that's 4,500 and. I'm sorry. I got to get the numbers down too. Well, so, let's do it live for everybody on Facebook to see. Yeah, yeah. So four, well, we've already pounds, done this. Perfect. Everybody yeah, on Facebook has already done this. So ten pounds. So ten pounds is four thousand five hundred and forty grams, and one percent of that is forty-five grams. So forty-five grams for ten pounds. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so then I, I times that by 10. Zero. 
I read it as point zero five percent. It's point five percent plus yeah point five percent equals one percent. Yeah. So the so they just took one percent off the top of every business, every grower. Yeah, and there's some weird stuff about they can they, they, they have to return the B sample to the to them later. It's some weird <laughs> stuff in there about that. The, the stuff won't yeah. be the same when they return it. I know, I know that. You know that. So the people, who wrote, these, the people right. who wrote these things don't know that. If you have a 100-pound harvest, which still could be a pretty small harvest for an outdoor grow, but if you have a 100-pound harvest, we're talking about having to, having to provide one entire pound of cannabis for testing. In Colorado, they need nine grams. Here, right, with a not particularly extraordinary size outdoor harvest, they're going to need an entire pound for testing. What are they going to do with a yeah. pound? It's for Think the much, office party. Think about what's yeah, in the lab. Right, right, right? Yeah. You know, they're worried, of, you know, like dispensaries are worried about being broken into. Imagine what's in a lab because of this. Imagine yeah, we don't even want to talk about that. that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I know. It, it's, look, it, it's, and again, this was not, uh, the, the 0.5% was not in any of the bills that I recall. Hmm. Um, did they have, no, have a sample batch size or, or no. an A and B sample? I like the A and B sample, honestly. I like the A B sample because then they, the labs can be held to some standards that if they've if they've issued a test result, they've got a B sample that somebody can come in there and test, and if the lab's selling results, that they can be held accountable for it. I like that. Yeah, it can work for that, but that but that's an awful lot just for that because no, I mean I, the way I see it, it, the way I see it, it would be for. Um, for if there's a recall, if they find mold or something in whatever the, the product is, um, and that B sample is going to be so different than it was when it was put there that it's not going to, it just doesn't labs, work. Labs are and then going to end up having to store hundreds and hundreds they and are, hundreds of pounds. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're already storing a lot. They're already storing a lot. Colorado requires nine grams for their testing. The sampling require requirement is about nine grams. Right. Does so it change with different batches size with a different batch size, or is it nine well, grams period? For basically, there's there is a SOP for harvests, and if I recall correctly, the 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 number of samples um, and the sample size it comes to about nine grams. And so, you know, if you want to have a reserve, 18 grams, right? Maybe you can even double that realistically. You could talk about maybe a quarter ounce that you have to provide for your harvest. But a pound? You know, and yeah, if, it's like a, if it's a massive outdoor grow, 200 pound, 500 well, pound? We need, to get rid of, we need to get rid of the 10 pound batch. We know that. Because right. if it's grown in the same conditions and in the same circumstances in the same place, harvested at the same time, it's all part of the harvest batch. And now, do right. you, should you should you have requirements that you, you go take samples from multiple parts and multiple plants and you know get yeah. a get a get a true accurate representation of the whole? Yes, but it's do not, we need it? Size doesn't matter. There you it's go. Not size about the doesn't sample matter. Sample size. It's not about the sample size. It's about the distribution. It's about how yeah. representative the sample is. It's not size. It's representativeness. And it's like I'm just gonna. Who's I'm gonna let that things? one Don't go. Don't know anything about statistics? <laughs> Don't they know the most basic thing about sampling statistics? This is this is unbelievable. Well, yeah, but let's go back to let's go back to you know as we're talking about testing, let's go back to one of the other regulations that says that if if something and I know some people don't like me saying this. But if that something doesn't pass a test for, say, mold or yeast or something like that, the way that regulations are currently written is that it must, it shall be destroyed. There's no remediation opportunity. And people can argue with me all the time they want that you can't remediate it. But if you extract it, utilizing extraction methods that we have available, you can clean the product and get rid of those things. They're left behind right. in the process. It happens all the freaking time. And yeah. what, I find, what I find the funniest is the people who are arguing that are the same ones who are going to farmer's market and buying their fruits and vegetables and stuff from farmer's market, which aren't subject, which the growers aren't subject to USDA controls, unlike right. the stuff that's in the in the grocery stores. So it's the same people that are arguing that. I'm like, you are, that is like the most flawed logic ever. You're okay with the farmer's market where it could be anything in it. 
but this can be remediated and retested and made sure it's clean before it's sold. They, they, there's no remediation. All that's going to happen with the result of that is black market. People can't throw away 100 pounds of marijuana. They're not. Well, no. they're not going to. I'm no. sorry. There's no business owner in the world that if a hundred if they did a 10 pound batch test and a 10 pound test positive, I, I don't know of many business owners that would just trash that. They're going to look for a solution to the problem, and the solution is extraction. Uh, to clean the product and get and extract the essential oils from the product and leave behind the remnants of those things. They've got to fix that. It is, it is utterly and completely ridiculous. Okay, let's move on. Lawrence, what have you got next? Well, Ron, in a way, mentioned the, the, the bizarre language that they use about destroying samples and returning un unused samples mm -hmm. and so on. And, Presumably a business that's out of their control once that sample has been brought back to them. So, you know, here's your four pounds of cannabis. Really, we only needed nine grams. The rest of it back. It's yours to use what you want. But, you know, a conscientious business, this is outside of our control for however many weeks the lab had it. We can't do anything with it. they got to destroy it. So they got to hand yeah. it over to the Sopranos, right? You know, they they, right. you know, basically what this do is doing is it's just accumulating and accumulating and accumulating, accumulating waste. Yeah, it's that's just, true. It's, it's basically creating a system what? of such massive waste that the Sopranos now come in and make a big fortune. And, and what, I would add, what I would say to this is I would love to know what a lab thinks that they need for the A and B sample to get accurate testing. Because, you know, if they, if, if they say they need the point – the 0.5 and 0.5, then I'm going to, I'm going to defer to the experts. But honestly, I, in, in talking to the guy from Fast Labs the other day, it's certainly they don't need that much for a sample. That's a ridiculous amount. They're, it's just – it's an absurdity for, for no reason. Okay, Lawrence, what have you got next? So uh, that now gets us to um, the subchapter on waste disposal. <laughs> and um, – all, all the things that I've highlighted and wanted to address, I've already covered. So, Ron, what else do you want to talk about? Okay. You know, so on the waste disposal stuff, there, there's a few issues that I've got with that. I've got the issue with the, you know, the problem is, is that they put in there, and I, can't, I read it, I read, went through it several times trying to figure it out. You know, there, with, with 886, there was a limitation of 10 licenses. So they're, they're copying that from the law. But they say they're only going to issue 10 licenses in the first two years. And then they said the requirements to get a license, and they don't put anything in the regulations that dictate how they're going to determine who the hell the 10 are. There's nothing that says who these 10 people are going to be. There's nothing that lays out, we're going to accept all these applications, and then we're going to evaluate them, and we're going to pick the ones that we believe are the 10 best. Is it hey the, 10, the first 10 that will, apply? Will it, will it be the first, maybe just, maybe just the first 10? Maybe it's the first 10, but it doesn't say that. And that's a concern for me, because I, here's the thing. I don't think that's the case. I think they're going to decide who gets these 10 licenses, and there's nothing that lays out the criteria for which they're going to determine who gets these 10 licenses. And I'm sorry, but that uncertainty breeds serious risk of corruption. Of course. That's what this is all about, in my opinion, that, you know, oh, yeah. people who push this forward, you know, what kind of backdoor agreements are going on such that, you know, the business is not going to be in their name. But nevertheless, to make sure that, you know, this bill goes through, what kind of promises have been made to them? This well, so is. Let's go with, you know, I'm going to walk around for a second because I'm, I'm dying for a cigarette. But let's go with the, the 10 licenses. And they, some, I don't remember who said it earlier. Uh, but let's pretend that the 10 licenses get issued to businesses that are in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. um, I was in, is it uh, Idabel? Idabel in the far reach, far southeast corner of Oklahoma, right near Texas takes three and a half hours in driving time to get there from Tulsa. Uh, so then go to Oklahoma City, let's add another hour and a half. So we've now got five hours of driving one way um, for a facility that was in Idabel. And because they had to transport by direct route back, mm. that means they have to send somebody, pick up the waste, and send them all the way back across the state five hours away uh, to, to have this waste disposed of. What do you think that's going to cost? That oh, is not going to be cheap. Yeah, that's you're talking about a lot of money. That's going to be extremely expensive. One pickup, right. is, one pickup is 10 hours of driving. One pickup is 10 hours worth of an employee driving. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't understand that waste management bill, not one bit. Should waste be disposed of, um, you know, in, in, a, in a conscientious manner? Yes. It, you know, are there issues with processors needing to be able to dispose of burnt brownies and expired products? And should we ensure that that's disposed of in, a, in an appropriate manner? Absolutely. Should we limit it to 10 licenses uh, and they have to go direct transport back? No, that that defies all common sense and logic. And then, and obviously, this the more, more onerous these things are, the, the the more motivation people are going to have to basically flood the black market, or or, and so, or figure out ways to dispose. If they burn a pan of brownies, oops, I didn't see it go in the trash can. Did you? Yeah, that's true. I mean, as well. yeah, you know, what, what it, you need is you we need reasonable compliance. You need compliance uh-huh. that people will actually comply with. Right, because it you know you don't. You, the more you the more you put restrictions on people, all you're going to do is punish the people who are following the law anyway and doing things the right way. The people who weren't doing things the right way aren't going to do it anyway. So all you're doing is making it harder for the guys who are trying to do an honest job. Okay, so let me see if I can kind of bring this together. Well, there's a lot what? of other stuff I was going to mention, but okay. Well, then go up. ahead. Let's hear it. Go ahead. Um, so what you got? Let me get back to my papers and stuff. You know, you, you interrupted my cigarette. <laughs> you interrupted my cigarette. We need it. We need a little stop, break here. A little I'll stop here. for you, fine folks, and and get back to my papers and, and get to a place where I can spread them out real quick. Hang on a second. And by the way, we've not taken any of the questions we promised we'd take, so we really need, need to be looking at questions. Well, so if- I've been reading, and I haven't seen a lot of questions. I probably missed a couple, but most of them are just comments, and most of people are pissed off. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I do want to add one thing while I'm getting these regulations ready. People are talking about, somebody said to me the other day uh, on one of my Facebook posts, they're like, well, you're always complaining about stuff. And you know how grumpy you've told me that. And, you know, the thing about it is, is that we've got to focus on the things that, that need to be fixed. I, I can't, patting people on the back is not going to, is not going to solve the problems that we've got. Yes, well, Ron, I never complained about you complaining. I complained about the way you complained. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I sometimes but you've have, gotten much better. Um, I, I, you, I sometimes have an issue. Uh, so, okay, one of the things that I, we didn't talk about in laboratory testing, the okay. LMMA in, in subchapter eight says that they, the department can come into a grower or a processor, and they can demand that the grower or processor send a sample. To, for laboratory testing at the grower processor's expense. Uh, that is, you're already requiring the test stuff before it goes out. What's the need to be able to demand at the processor or grower's expense uh, that they get more stuff tested because you've asked them to, or told them to? So uh, wait, what, so what is this? They just would show up and just decide to send you, tell you to send something to be tested? Let me read the exact language. It says, the department may require a medical marijuana commercial, commercial licensee to submit a sample of a medical marijuana, medical marijuana concentrate, or medical marijuana product to a licensed testing laboratory upon demand. The cost for all sampling and tests conducted pursuant to these rules shall be the financial responsibility of the commercial licensee. So they could walk into a dispensary and point yep. at something and say, I demand you have that tested. Yep, absolutely. That is utterly and completely ridiculous. I mean, you know, we, we already give them $2,500 per license. They've gotten $46 million plus in sales tax revenue that's directed first to the Department of Health to cover regulatory uh, costs, and yet they can walk into a dispensary, demand that 15 things be tested, and the owner has to bear the expense? What? That, 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 when I read that, that blew my mind. Um, so that is something that I have wow. a huge issue with. Um, yeah. Well, imagine All this. Right. Imagine you're in a dispensary and some investigator comes in and he says, I'm going to require that every single product in your store gets tested. Yeah. That's, right? uh, if no, they got a grudge, if they got a grudge, if they have, you know, they didn't get the right payoff or who knows what, you know, that's what they could use to kind of, you know, extort money out of out of a business. I, this I is agree. Prime for corruption. It is prime for corruption from inspectors. I, I agree, and it, it makes no sense. You're requiring them to test this stuff. You're not requiring a lab to go out there and send a sampler to collect the damn samples, and now we can spot demand that you send more stuff to a laboratory at your expense for sample collection and for testing. 
it makes no sense. I don't understand the logic of it. You know, if OMA, if there was a reason that an inspector believed that a grow was being nefarious and, and substituting product for tested product and using old tests to sell, I could see a point of that they, you know, putting something in there that says that those people are allowed to collect a sample for testing by the state. It makes mm. perfect sense. Do mm. that. But, you know, this ridiculous requirement just – I, I, I'm yet to figure out who came up with this or what the logic was behind it. it it's crazy to me. I can tell you what the logic is. There, there's no longer civil asset forfeiture, or at least there's a Supreme Court decision against civil asset forfeiture, that you know, cannabis in the state has been legalized for medical purposes. 50% of all arrests in certain jurisdictions are related to cannabis. And so how is it that small town sheriffs have been able to finance their payroll all this time? Well, Basically that's true. through right, so so now they could become OMMA inspectors and find a new way. <laughs> well, that's that's a very good point. Um, well, the OMMA, good... wait, wait, OMMA inspectors right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they're health department food inspectors, right? That is who they've contracted with. For okay, inspectors. so you're telling me that somebody who goes into a restaurant and inspects a restaurant will be will now they not only have now have the power to go close any restaurant they don't like. But they can go into dispensary and demand everything be tested there too. This is yeah. extremely way and over just, the top. And there's no limit. There's no limit on what they can demand be tested. Right. It, they, right. It, anything they want to be tested, they can they can walk into a dispensary and say, "I demanded that vape cards in package 15 be sent to, for immediate testing, and those dabs be sent, and those diamonds be sent, and some that's of that exactly flower, some problem. of that flower, and some yep, of that flower, exactly and some of that flower." Problem. All be said. And hey, by the way, if they demand full panel, it's three hundred and sixty dollars or three hundred fifty dollars a pop. Exactly. Exactly. And it's all at the owner's expense. Or so, you could so just, uh, or you could slip them a few hundred dollar bills, and they could just leave. I mean, that's that, exactly look, my is, concern. Yeah, that's exactly again, my concern. If, if they wanted to collect a sample, so for example, say a dispensary had a vape card, and the, the OMA for some reason wanted had an issue with the processor. And they wanted to go out to some of the facility, some of the dispensaries that they're selling to, and pull some of their carts from the shelf. What I think they should do is pay the dispensary what they got for the cart, what they paid for the cart. Take the cart. They can send it off for testing and do whatever the hell they want to with it. Fine, no problem whatsoever. But when you put such an open thing and the expense on the business owner for whatever test they demand, with no limitation, right. that is right. just. So, right, so imagine this. Imagine there's some, there's some small town who doesn't want any dispensary in that town. Somebody opens up a dispensary, and they have the local inspector go in and say, what we're going to do is every month we're going to come in, and we're going to require full panel testing on every single thing in your inventory until you shut down and you go to that other town down the road. Yep. And look, that is an extreme, you know, and I do, for the people who are going to say this to us, you guys are going to the extreme. I always, as a lawyer, I always look at worst case scenario. That is what I'm, like, my natural brain is what I'm trained to do is what is the worst case scenario in this? Because we need to see that so we know what the potential problems are. Right, right. Well, and unfortunately, us as cannabis users um, are used to having to go to the extreme because it's been used against us to the extreme for so many years. Right. So none of this seems out of the realm of possibility to me. As somebody who's lived in Oklahoma since 1979, this all seems plausible. Unfortunately, 507,000 voted for medical marijuana, and then the Capitol said, no, we don't like that idea. And we've been dealing with that ever since. So you know, what have you got next, happen? Lawrence? Well, I, I've I mean, covered I'm, all the things I want to address. I meant mean, Ron. I'm sorry. I meant Ron. What have you got next? Um. So it's a weird, it's a weird uh, little provision. I'm going to back up a second, but there's a part of the transporter license that says, "This license shall not authorize licensed growers, processors, or dispensaries to transport, store, or distribute medical marijuana or medical marijuana products on behalf of other medical marijuana licensees." So the whole idea of like people who are making pre rolls for people and then selling them on dispensaries, like there's going to have to be an actual transfer of the ownership of the product. And that's a minor little thing. I just wanted to mention that. 
Um, on the go, going back to the laboratory stuff again, because that's where I have most this, where I have most of my issues. Um, if you look at uh, it's three ten six eighty one dash eight dash two. Lawrence is on page fifty seven of mine. Mm. Um, if a lab submits an application prior to the end of this year, they can submit the application with having simply applied for accreditation that's required under this uh, thing. If you right. wait till January 1 to submit an application, you have to be fully accredited before you can apply. Mm -hmm. Why they only gave businesses two months or less than two months uh, to get these applications in for these uh for these laboratories makes no sense, and a lot of these, a lot of these accreditations, though, and the accreditations that are required, a lot of these things have to have been open for a while. So what they've done is they've severely restricted new people getting into laboratory testing uh, because they've required them to get their accreditation first, which can take years, and then come back and apply then. So they've essentially created a, uh, a restricted market in laboratory testing. Uh, if you don't have one of those specific accreditations. And again, it makes no sense to me. And I know a lot of the labs already have those accreditations. But again, I'm talking about people who want to come into this industry and open a lab that don't have one of those things. They need to get their applications in before the end of the year and apply for that accreditation uh, before the end of the year. So that's just a warning to those people who want to open a lab. Yeah, let me, um, let me speak to that. I, I remember the conversation at the uh, legislative working group last year on this issue. And so it, during some of the final weeks of that working group, they brought in some lab experts and they were addressing the issue about accreditation. And they were raising this question about whether or not they could let labs start do the testing while they were applying for accreditation and then give them enough lead time so that eventually they could say by a certain date X, all the labs have to be accredited. And they asked that, they asked the witness there whether how long it should take for accreditation and it was six to eight months so during the working group this conversation came up and it was like well within six to eight months they should be able to be accredited and mm -hmm. so way go way back you know basically to whenever this was october 2018 and during the whole process of rollout they said okay january 1st 2020 that's so far ahead right that gives right. everybody enough time well here we are now you know in november 2019 when yeah, and, and there's all kinds of problems like that. It, it, look, one of the reasons why I bring these things up about laboratories, some people are like probably glazed over and don't care. I look at things that are going to drive up costs of things. And to me, all these things are going to drive up costs or they're going to keep costs high because we have the highest testing costs of any other state. A full panel in Colorado is like $95. It's $360 here. Some labs, it's more expensive. And, and under that same vein, if you look at personnel, there's a provision that says a licensed laboratory shall not operate unless a medical laboratory director is on site during yeah. operational hours. I'm that is that. insanity. Yeah. So if your director, and, and, and I'm going to talk about the requirements for a director in a second because they're freaking the most absurd things I've ever read. But if you're a lab director, he has to leave for lunch. You can't freaking test. He can't go to lunch. He's got to be there because the minute they're out of the building, all testing and work must stop even though they're not directly supervising it. Uh, so, again, drives up the cost. And then when you talk about the requirements for a lab director, it's two years of experience in the environmental analysis of representative inorganic and organic analytes for which the laboratory will be performing. A master's degree or doctoral degree in one of the above disciplines may be substituted for one year of experience. Like, holy shit. Like, you're not going to go, there's not going to be a whole lot of lab directors that are available to hire in the state of Oklahoma. So that lab director that. better be ready to work 24 hours a day if, he's, if we're going to get testing results out efficiently. You know why they did that? Uh, and, and they're going to write their own check, too, as far as right. their pay. Lawrence, why do you think they did that, Lawrence? Because the idea was is that they wanted to have somebody that's well enough credentialed that they have, you know, something really seriously at stake here. And they're going to be uh, feel compelled to make sure that everything going on but beneath them is on the up and up. They have a business and, at stake here. I mean, you know, there's a business at stake. Then, then why this? 
testing personnel, the people who are running the testing facility, literally taking a sample, putting it on a tray, they must have a bachelor's degree with a minimum of two years of experience or an associate's degree in five years of experience. Experience what? Testing cannabis? Yeah, test. Well, test yet you can't. Yet you can't get a. You can't get a not, not transport cannabis. license if you haven't lived here two years. Not cannabis. No, the, the, the experience anything. running, in the working in a lab, testing, doing analytic procedures and okay. tests. But All they're right. going to have a bachelor's degree in two years of experience, or an associate's degree in five years of experience. Again, going back to, it is going to drive up the costs of testing. Uh, exponentially because of these requirements and then again add that they have to send their own people out to the facilities to collect the samples which by the way fortunately all they have to have is a high school diploma that's nice that, that's all they have to have they have to have a high school diploma to to pull samples yes uh, ancillary personnel must possess a high school diploma or or equivalent so I guess they can have a GED so okay yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, again, that's, just, I, I mean, that's not statute. That's coming out of the that. No, those, that's coming out of that's job not department. statute. That is not statute. Okay. I, I love this one. Um, so this is under the security requirements. This is under the section dealing with waste management. But it, the way they've written it, it applies. To, it says OMMA licensed entities, and an OMMA licensed entity is any entity that's licensed, right? They've written it in very broad terms, even though they buried it in the waste management section, and it says that the licensee. So any dispensary processor or uh, grower shall dispose of all medical marijuana waste in a secure waste receptacle. The receptacle shall be kept in a safe and secure location with limited access. All limited access areas, so that, uh, fine, we want to keep the disposal of cannabis in a secure place. Fine, I can live with that. Then this, it has this. All limited access areas must be identified by the posting of a sign which shall be a minimum of 12 inches by 12 inches and shall state in the English language, do not enter limited access area, access limited to licensed owners, employees, and contractors only, and lettering no smaller than half inch by half inch in height. All access areas shall be secured with commercial grade two non-residential locks. Locks are required for all points of ingress and egress to the limited access areas. The secure container must not be easily movable and must be locked using the minimum block standards of the container itself. What? So yeah. separate we lock room. Behind a door, and then we have to secure it in the damn locked room. That, I love the logic of that. So you have to have now you have to have a room for your waste. Yeah, and a sign that says, you know, limited access area. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I just. And then, this is where the stuff is stored the, that you can the, steal. In that limited access area, using commercial grade two locks to get into the room, you also have to secure the container containing the waste to something to where it's not easily movable. Because the door wasn't freaking enough, yeah. um, and the keys to the door weren't enough. We had to secure the shit inside the room. You don't even have to secure your grow that well, do you? Well, no, but it, it goes back to the whole transport thing where the, you can't transport the stuff unless it's in a secure part of the vehicle, not readily accessible to the driver who loaded the shit yeah. in the damn did you, vehicle. Did you did you um, see the clothing requirements for the sample takers? Yes, I saw the yeah. clothing requirements for the samplers. You know, but it, again, I'm going to go back to the fact that growers don't want somebody coming in their facility that's been in 10 other grows that day. So, I, I mean, hell, the growers might make them take off all their clothes and wash them down in betadine. Um, I can see I can see growers having some stringent requirements with that. Um, and then here's I'm going to quote you the language I talked about earlier. When determining and reporting the route to take, waste disposal facility licensees should select the best direct route that provides efficiency and safety. Direct route. So those are my biggest issues. I've got a lot more, but we've already talked about this kind of you know ad nauseum. All right, so let me let me try and bring it all together then, like I was saying earlier. Um, and I need an honest answer here. Do you see if if all this was to if all this moves forward, as you've said, this is all actually the law now. Um, how much of this is being is, is being complied with today? Can't be um, grumpy. It can't be complied with today. There are okay, no so, licensed laboratories. There's no licensed waste management facilities. So what is the solution? So what is the solution? Because I've got businesses calling me asking, what do we do now? How do we get our samples to the lab? 
That's the problem. Let me tell you the solution. I have a, Grumpy, I have, I have a solution, but I'm not ready to announce my solution yet. Okay, Lawrence, what do you got for us? Suspend these emergency rules. Have a competent board with industry experts, people who really know what they're doing, convene. And then produce reasonable requirements and have a public review of them. Oh, and no, no. So You're using with... common sense again. There he goes again with the common sense. I, I do think Grumpy I, was what Lawrence just said. I think that they OMA needs to put out a moratorium, an announcement, like we talked about yeah. in our meeting. They need to put right. out an announcement on their page that says we are not requiring uh, enforcement of these particular ordinances or these particular regulations until you can actually comply with them. And we will make an announcement and send an email to all licensed businesses when to expect that we have got these things ready to go and you can actually comply with them. If they would do that, that would solve a lot of these problems. Without that, technically every business in the state of Oklahoma that is in this industry is violating the regulations already. Have been since the first. This doesn't sound good. I don't see how we get through next week with these rules. Let me put it to you this way, that we are we are optimistic that there's going to be goodwill coming from the new commission. Uh, right, I'm help. optimistic there's going to be goodwill. Right. I don't think they're going to right. – they're not I, – I don't think that they are going to be penalizing anybody for not being able to comp in compliance with these. As a lawyer, though, right. it is very concerning to me when a business is supposed to be following a law that they cannot comply with, and we have nothing official from the agency that says right. we're going to give you that. Do I expect right. Commissioner Cox – and, Kirk pa and, and Director K Kirkpatrick to be banging down people's doors because they didn't comply with these? No. So please just, if they watch this, put out something that says you're going to give, there's time here. They could have yeah, put that's... it in the damn, they could have put it in the damn regulations that says these provisions don't take effect for 120 days. They didn't right. do that. See, this is my point. My, my point is, is that th this is the product of bad faith, right? This document is the product of bad faith. And right. so the new commissioner comes in, the new director comes in and says, like, we, we are coming in because of the problems that existed with the previous administration. Right. And so we're not. And so out of good faith, out of an understanding, out of a recognition that we have this moral charge upon us to do better, we are going to put out a 120 day moratorium. And in that time period, we're going to convene a new board and we're going to bring in consultants. And we're going to produce a set of regulations that are responsible, that are, that people can realistically comply with, that are not extremely onerous, and that are properly informed. So we we have this hope of good faith from the new administration, and a way for them to express that good faith is to do what Ron is suggesting: for them to make an announcement that these rules are going to be suspended in whole or in part for 120 days as they convene and produce something that is informed and responsible. Well, that would be great. And in a perfect world, that's what they would do tomorrow. Um, I have a feeling that's not what's going to happen, and I think that it's time to start looking at perhaps an injunction. I think perhaps that they're going to have to be stopped. We, we, don't, we don't mention that yet. Shh. Let's do it right. Let's do it the right way. Well. I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, hearing all this, how anybody survives in this industry, why anybody would ever want to go into it. The state has made this the, the biggest mess they could possibly make it. Just the simple fact that they have attorneys sitting on the board writing the regulations that are okay with conflict when they ha are supposed to, as part of their job, find harmony in their own regulations. Right. I mean, that in itself should get them removed from their position and somebody more competent put in that position, or at least somebody, if it's not competency, because I hate to say that, if, it, if it's not, then it must be deliberate. So somebody who's not deliberately trying to send out uh, conflict in their, in their own regulations, deliberately not trying to leave bombshells all over to shut businesses down and scare half of these people so bad they start selling and closing their doors just out of fear. Right. Well, you know, I think when it comes to that, time is going to tell on our new director and our, and our new uh, commissioner of the Department of Health. We, you know, we made very clear in that meeting we had with them Friday that 
I, again, I've offered to, and I'm not saying that that they should take my word on everything or, or defer to me on anything, but you know what? I could have clearly pointed out to them the problems in this. You could have, a lot of people could have. They should take mm -hmm. some public comment on things, even if it's a short window. You know, it's, it's better to put out, It's. It, I understand speed, but you put out speed on these regulations that nobody can comply with. So why were you in such a hurry? Nobody can comply with the testing requirements. Nobody can comply with the waste management requirements. There's no licensed laboratories from OMA. There was no reason to speed through these things. And so what I would encourage them to do is issue something that says there is, where there's a moratorium on enforcement of these regulations until you can comply with them. And, and we will give you more notice as things develop. So we'll see how they react. That's, that's going to be the key. How do they react? What do they do now? That's what we're going to judge Cox and Kirkpatrick on. Okay. Well, I guess we'll just have to give it a little time and see what happens. Maybe they do something in the next week or two. Um, you know, the, yesterday would have been good, but you say they put out more today. Well, they didn't with, put out more today. They, they fixed – they were in such a rush to put things out, like they left, like, Chapter 6, they left it completely out. Um, right. People were messaging me, like, Ron, what happened to Chapter 6? I'm like, I don't know. It was – I don't see anything where they repealed it, so I'm not really sure. And what it was was they released a draft that didn't have it in there. Well, that could have been a perfect opportunity to just say uh, – we're to, to do what you, what you guys have suggested here, that we're just going to put a moratorium on. That's what I'm saying is well, look, my they, concern they, is they, since they, they've already – they've doubled down by rolling them out again – with all the missing pieces, so I'm still they pass, waiting. They pass them on an emergency basis, they can amend them on an emergency basis. That's uh -huh. my point. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So do you think we're looking at maybe a month before they would do anything, since they only meet about once a month, or? We'll see. I mean, they don't meet once a month. Gary Cox and them can put out new stuff tomorrow uh, if they wanted to. They could literally put out an addendum to these rules on the end of the laboratory testing and on the end of the waste management, which will solve two huge areas of concern. And they can say these these regulations shall not take effect for 120 days or 90 days. And then if, if 90 days they weren't ready and didn't have any licensed labs, they could come back and do another one that says, you know, it would be another 30 days from today's date. They could do that very, very easily. I mean, Governor Stitt's very clearly shown that he's just a rubber stamp of signing whatever's sent to him. So it's not like they're going to have any problems with him signing the daggum things. All right, so we are going to wrap it up here fairly soon, but I won't, this has mostly been a, a, about a, what the businesses are having to deal with and just acknowledging that it will affect the patients. But I do want to address one specific patient issue, um, and that would be something we talked about before we started. And yes, that is, please, uh, let's do that. Yeah, that is um, specific rules written that are in these uh, rules we were talking about tonight as to patient diversion um, and what yes. that fine will be, a fine of, I think, 250 for the first time. I think it's 100 uh, well, than 200 is what what's I What's that? I think it was 100 and 200, but, again, don't trust my memory on that. It's not, I don't have it memorized. Okay, well, I know there's, there's two stages to it. I thought it was, like, 250 and then something else. But I think stage two, doesn't that where you could lose your card also? Yes, yeah, correct. And, and they don't and, – and here's why I bring this up and why – you know, you're ready for this, I'm sure, why this is an issue, because they don't define diversion. So Jerry, explain. Grubby, yeah. I've said this a thousand times. Patients cannot share medicine with other patients. Forget these regulations. The law, there's nothing that authorizes them to do that under Oklahoma law. Right. It is still a felony to do that. Do right. not share medicine, especially don't do it on Facebook where you're passing the bong around for the love of God. Stop doing that. Yeah, that that's definitely uh, needs to happen a lot less. I think it will. I have talked to some people that uh, that, that have done that in the past that do videos regularly and uh, explained this to them this week and gotten a, a good response. They've understood. They've actually gotten scared and um, are now worried, which isn't necessarily what I wanted them to do, but I wanted well, let's it be clear. to stop. I would, patients should be able to share medication with other patients, especially if they live in the same residence, they've grown it together, whatever. So I'm not saying that I'm advocating that that should not be allowed. What I'm saying is that under current law and current regulations, it is not allowed. So that, yeah, that's I've, why I've, I have to encourage stopping not doing that. Passing yeah, a I've joint, said – Passing a ahead. joint in the park, and they, there's some kids that were arrested for this, um, passing a, a joint in the park is 
somebody got arrested on felony distribution for passing a joint. So th th there is a real concern there. And so just don't do not do it um, in public. Please, for the love of God, just stop doing that. All right. Well, there we go, folks. Don't do it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we should wrap it up. We've been going on quite a while. Have you guys got anything? Lawrence, have you got anything you'd like to add before we leave? Uh, I'll generally say that it, it's time for this adversarial attitude to end. Mm -hmm. that, okay. You know, this is not 1967. You know, the world has changed. 5% of, of Oklahomans are licensees. Over 50 countries around the world have legalized cannabis medicine. Uh, over 250 million people in 33, 34 states. Canada, Mexico, the country has changed. The world has changed. And it's just time to stop thinking in this ideological sense. This is a plant that's been around for thousands of years, has been used medically for thousands of years. It's a weird blip of history that it got banned, and it's time for that attitude to end. Okay. Thank you, Lawrence. Ron, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. I, something we didn't talk about, the results of Senate Bill 1030, uh, granting cities and counties the ability to ban growers and processors and all but, as a matter of law, restrict dispensaries, to me, it has created a situation and the way that they're applying these things, retro, the courts are going to apply these things retroactively as a as a clarifying definition of what they meant by what we meant by 788, even though the legislature didn't pass 788. Um, I think that if we don't, if that does not get fixed in the next legislative session, then there is no reason that I could possibly believe that they're going to fix that because the Oklahoma Municipal League uh, and the county commissioners that all get together and have a, a, a sort of a, PA, a, a PAC uh, and, a, and a, a lobbyists, I think we're in a situation that we've got to take the power and control out of the hands of the legislature. I, I'm, I'm going to reiterate my support for uh, two new petitions uh, that have medical and adult access, full use, uh, as a constitutional amendment. Because unfortunately, while we've got some great people working in the legislature to try to help make this industry work, uh, we've got the you know Oklahoma Senate, and so. Be out there. If you're out there watching this, understand that these petitions are going to be coming, uh, and I think we have to we have to work hard to get them because they are piece by piece, uh, regulation by regulation, line by line, killing this industry, killing the opportunity for Oklahomans uh, who have generated more than forty six million dollars in sales tax revenue and probably twenty million dollars in license fees to the state at this point. Um, they're killing them. And so that's the only way we're going to fix a lot of these problems. It's unfortunate that we're not going to be able to resolve it other ways, but that's where we're at. We need to get we need to get some constitutional initiative petitions out there and done. Okay, Ron, thank you. I think you've done you've both done a good job of of wrapping up the problems here. Uh, we definitely need some some major changes. Uh, again, I say 507,000 of us voted for this. And the and we decided we want a medical marijuana and we want to be able to use it without it affecting our lives detrimentally. We didn't want to lose our jobs, our homes, our families. Um, all of that is going on. Uh, I was on the phone with somebody earlier today. Um, I've got to follow up when I get off uh, when we get done here. Somebody up in the Alva area who's being been told today by DHS they can't be around their grandkids there because they're a medical marijuana card holder. So. The bigotry has continued. Uh, Lawrence, you've done a good job of, of using that word when it's been necessary in the last week, because I think that's where we're at as a society. We've got to point it out, call it what it is, and, and start changing minds, even if that's one person at a time. Ron, you're right. The Senate is our biggest problem um, coming up with this election year. Uh, we have a chance to fix that. I think we'd probably be more successful at running a petition than we will at changing the Senate, unfortunately. So maybe we need to figure out how to do both of those. At least make some, a couple small tweaks in the Senate, which should be enough to perhaps get them working for the people again. All right. Well, I think that's about it for tonight. Uh, Lawrence, I think you've got control of the room, but for me, that's it. So until next time, stay grumpy. We'll see you on the road. How do I stop it?
you just hit the live and hit cancel. Okay. There, I got it. 